Thank you everyone for joining us for this webinar, More Than Just Monitor Mixing, part two with Eddie Kaipo. My name is Michael Grandinetti, and I'm a content marketing coordinator here at Harman. A few things before we get started. Everyone on the call is muted to keep down noise levels during the webinar. However, there is a Q&A function where you can submit questions to the presenter, and he will try to answer as many as possible at the end. This webinar will also be recorded and the link will be made available a few days after the presentation. We do have a number of other webinars taking place over the next few months for audio, lighting, video, and control. And we encourage you to take a look at the different webinars in our Learning Sessions Workshop Series on pro.harman.com, as well as by visiting Harman Professional Training to see our many on-demand and certification courses that are available to you for free. And now I would like to introduce to you the presenter for today's webinar. As a mixing engineer, Eddie has worked with some of the biggest names in the music industry. He's currently the monitor engineer for Enrique Iglesias and Gwen Stefani. And he's also mixed for artists such as Christina Aguilera, Smash Mouth, Tears for Fears, and many more. And now I'll pass it over to you, Eddie. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining me uh, here in this learning sessions with uh, JBL and Harmon. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Eddie Kaipo. Um, I'm currently mixing Enrique Iglesias and Gwen Stefani. And, uh, you know, today my goal is to just share a lot of, uh, uh, you know, my experiences and things that, uh, that you know, I do throughout my, my time working with all these artists. Um, some of the artists that I, that I work for, have worked for are, you know, like Michael mentioned, you know, Gwen Stefani, Christina Aguilera, uh, Tear for Fears, I'm currently with Enrique Iglesias and Gwen, then Kings of Chaos, Smash Mouth, um, and Julio Iglesias, just to name a few. Um, I, I find this important, not for bragging rights, but a lot of the things that I'm gonna talk about today are, you know, things that apply to every artist in one, one way or the other. and and it's important to to know that because uh, you know a lot of people think, well, you know, we work with an artist, you can't really do this, we can't do that. But really, a lot of these things apply to everybody, and and including um, you know up and coming artists. I feel that is that is important to um, to say that because I'm gonna discuss things that I I on my approach of, of things that I've done since I started. Uh, it's nothing different. The only things that have changed is, is, is timing and how I approach things with certain artists, but it's all the basis, basics are the same. So it's something to uh, uh, keep in mind throughout this presentation that you can apply this to any scenario, any artist, whether they're famous or not famous. I've just been very fortunate in the last few years to uh, be able to work with a, a lot of A-list artists and, uh, you know, uh, that just obviously is very, very encouraging and, and very, a lot of fun and, and, and things like that, but it applies to everybody. Um, let me try to make sure I can see this in a larger view. There you go. Okay, so what are we gonna talk about today? Uh, first thing will be what I call beyond mixing. You know, I'm, I'm gonna really focus on, on not there's not going to be a lot of technical stuff per se until certain moments because there's a lot of people who do that they do it very well what i want to share with you is really my experiences with artists how to deal with them how to deal with situations when when you're doing that uh, how to uh, uh, prepare for a uh, uh, for the gig you know all the steps that i take to prepare or while i'm while i'm there how to deal with the situations deal with the artists with band members and that sort of thing um, the next thing we'll talk about is don't be that sound guy. And uh, really just to kind of do a quick overview about that is, is you know, the typical cliche of, that we all know, you know, the grumpy sound guy at a club. Um, in fact, I wrote an article about that on Live Sound Magazine where, you know, I discussed this. And that, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, you know, how to, how to approach your career since you're starting. Because I feel that, you know, we, we still have a lot of people that are like that and, and, and they, you know, they just really don't either like their career or they're, they're just grumpy for some reason. So, and, uh, and I know there's some funny videos out there about grumpy sound guys, so we'll talk a little bit about that, which I find it to be important 
on how you approach your career um, and working with artists. So uh, how to achieve your mixing goals, how to, how to get to the point where you're comfortable with your mix and whatever you're delivering to your artists. Um, a couple of these things are gonna be reviews of, of the first video that we did uh, of the part one of uh, more than just uh, monitor mixing. Um, preparing for the gig, or using virtual soundcheck and snapshots to, um, to prepare and to deliver that sound that you're looking for for your artist. Uh, we will discuss plugins or any kind of tool that I use uh, as, a, as a review based on what we did on the first video. And I will focus a little more on processing uh, in your monitors. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about that as we move along. Uh, and then one of the important things and very valuable um, things that I, on how I approach things is really keeping an eye on what the occlusion effect and how, it, how I deal with it, how it affects what I do. Um, and, and, you know, why is it there and, and all those things. You know, a lot of people take that for granted, but we'll, we'll discuss all of that. Um, let's go to the next slide. So beyond mixing. Um, for me, this is pretty important. You know, like I said, uh, there's a lot of people with equal or more, uh, you know, technical ability as a sound engineer than, than I am, you know, or than I have. But they, they, you know, what makes a difference is how you approach dealing with the artist uh, and communicating. So for me, uh, as I say here, the three C's are pretty crucial. Uh, you know, communication, communication, and communication. That's key for me. Um, I have had experiences where, you know, you kind of are kept at bay, and you're not able to really communicate with the artist, and that usually doesn't go well. Um, and, and you, you know, because they sometimes may have an assistant, and that assistant has an assistant, they, by the time they come and give you the directive of what they're looking for, not only did we miss the cues, but at that point the frustration kicks in, or or it also gets you know like what do you call that game like a, a tiny telephone or whatever, or broken telephone where they come and tell you each person that gets the message by the time it gets delivered to you, you already uh, missed it, or or they, they already tell you something that is not correct. So I feel that it's always important to discuss it directly with the artist. Whenever possible, you're not here to like become their best buddy or nothing like that, or or cross any lines of of professional distance. But I feel that it's important that you you have some line of communication with the artist, band members. Uh, you know, everybody everybody in that production is crucial. Everybody uh, that you can communicate with will make your job easier, and in return, make you know the show better. Uh, and, and everybody happy. If the artist is happy, everybody's gonna be happy down the line. So communication, it's absolutely key uh, to, you know, to basically develop what I, I, I said in the next point here, which is to build trust. Uh, that's another very important uh, subject for me. If, if, you, if the artist, band member, or anybody on stage that you're delivering any kind of sound to, can't trust you because maybe you get distracted or because or maybe you, you're not really uh, engaging with them, then, you know, it won't work. It will simply won't work. And there's no technical ability that will buy you that position that way. Because at the end of the day, you know, when you're talking to your artist and you're engaging in that communication and trying to build trust, you know, if there's an issue with sound, the artist may ask you, hey, what's the problem that I'm hearing? It sounds like this. You know, they don't care if you come and tell them, uh, hey, you know, what happens is, you know, this microphone has a little bit of 5K build up here, whatever. They don't care about that. They really don't. It's rare that anybody really wants to know frequencies or you give them a, a acoustical information about the venue. All they want is for it to sound good for it to sound the way they want it, and for them to be comfortable and be able to perform. So by you not, you know, either BSing them and giving them excuses of why uh, the sound is not exactly like they want it, I think it's important to always be honest with them. Always tell them what's happening and, and tell them, you know, uh, you know, 
I'm having an issue with this, but I'm gonna solve it. You know, I got I got this, I got you. Don't worry, just I need two minutes, or I need three minutes, or just give me a second, I'll solve it. Or you go and ask him, so what are you hear? What are you hearing? What's what what do you feel is the issue? Tell me. And then it comes to the point where they might tell you something uh that is not as clear. They might tell you, well, it sound I feel like it's you know, you know, muddy, or it might uh you know, I want it to sound blue, or whatever it is, and, and it's a matter of your interpretation. It, that's when we come in. You know, we, we have to find a way to interpret uh, what, what they're saying and make that be somehow uh, converted into something technical and say, okay, well, they, it sounds muddy. Okay, well, that to me is maybe take some of the low mids off or a little bit of the lows. Or, and you have to find it. And then when they say, oh, that's good, you know that now, from that point forward, this is what they meant. And I think that's incredibly important. And that definitely is part of the, the three C's, the communication portion of it, and building trust. Make sure you're engaging with them. Make sure you're not uh, just ignoring them, you know? Um, ensuring that the artist is comfortable on stage at all times. Um, I'm a strong believer that not just sonically, of course, I'm the mixer, uh, so I have to make sure that they're comfortable on stage in that department. But if there's anything, you know, like even if it's not your job to go do it, if there's an assistant or whatever, if you see that maybe your artist is going to need some water or whatever, I'll radio in. Hey, you know, uh, so and so needs some 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 water, or they're looking for a towel, or they want a lyric sheet or whatever it is, you know, and just kind of keep an eye on everything. Like he like like have your artist back no matter what it is. And believe it or not, even with, with things like that, the artist feels like you're paying attention to them. Not just sonically, not just with, with your uh, sound engineering skills or anything like that, but also with, you know, um, everything around them. You kind of keeping an eye on them all around, you know? Um, something that, that happens a lot with me is, for those who, who saw the first video, I mentioned this. I have a multi-view uh, with, you know, all the cameras, and, and I have a screen with multi-view with all, all the camera shots for my artists, and that allows me to see uh, their facial expressions, or if something happened that I, where I can see them, and they're far away. In the case of Enrique, you know, we have a, a C stage, where he's on the other side of front of the house, and, you know, if something happens, or the mic gets dropped, or if I see in, in his face that something's happening, I could ask him, I could talk to him via talkback and say, you know, is, that, is everything okay? And they'll nod, and, and nobody knows that we're communicating that way. But but uh, it's important that they know that you're watching their every move, you know? Um, I did have an artist, uh, uh, when I was one of my, my first gig with them doing monitors where I literally just turned to look at one of the musicians, and it was a little too long. The artist was right in front of me saying, eyes on me, I need to make sure you're looking at me. And that was a learning experience because, you know, this person was right. I had to be looking at them, especially because they, they didn't do sound checks. So I had to really stare at them to make sure that first song, any changes that needed to be made, I could do it. And that was actually on my first gig with them. And I ended up working uh, with them for like nine years. So it was great. Uh, but it's something that is important. We have to keep an eye on, on, on your artists at all times, watch them like a hawk, as they say. And, and that, in return, if they walk on stage and they feel nervous, because every artist has some form of insecurity or whatever, sometimes, you know, it's, it takes a lot of guts to be able to go on stage and perform in front of thousands of people, or whether it's 10 people, you know, or like even what I'm doing now. I get nervous just, I was talking to Michael earlier, I get nervous just, being here talking to all of you guys through my camera, because it's not something I do, but uh, it, all that happens. Anybody who's in any type of performance is always gonna have some kind of a small anxiety or worry, right? So when they turn around and they look at you and they know you're like watching them and you're paying attention, sometimes they don't need anything. They just look at you and go, okay, I'm gonna be okay, because they're, they're paying attention and they're watching me or whatever. So that's incredibly important. Um, Listen to what your artists or performers are saying. That is <clears throat> possibly uh, one of the issues that I've 
seen some of my colleagues make sometimes, some of the uh, mistakes, I should say, that I've learned from people who are sometimes experienced. And, and, and this particular artist uh, didn't perhaps uh, uh, like or, or, or the way they approach a certain situation. Or I've seen people do, you know, just ignore their requests. You know, I think it's important to, like I said, don't disregard their request. It may sound crazy, it may sound illogical to you, but at the end of the day, you're not the one who is on stage. You're not the one with, you know, thousands of people watching you in the middle of the stage or a runway where, you know, it sounds different than the way it sounds for us at the mixing board. You know, that's, that's something that we always have to keep in mind. If they tell us, look, it sounds, I need more clarity here. I need, you know, it sounds too dry. And and you think it needs more? It doesn't need more reverb, for instance. Uh, but they do. Then you just give it to them. You know, it's not about us uh, m being a modern engineer. It's a position of service. Basically, we have to deliver what they want. Uh, we can we can have certain guidelines and kind of help them through it, and 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 you know, give them little little things here and there that we feel could benefit them on the mix. But at the end of the day, if they don't like it or if they feel like, no, 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 that's too much of this, I want less of that or more of this, we just have to do it. So don't disregard their request. That's, that's kind of something that I go by all the time. Um, you know, people sometimes say, hey, you know, my artist was asking for this, man. They just don't know. I was like, well, honestly, we're the ones who need to know because they're the ones, like I said, they're on stage. For them, things sound completely different, especially you know, when they're the ones singing or playing an instrument that will really vibrate or resonate through their body, uh, which I will discuss that later on the occlusion effect um, in, a, in a few minutes, it will, all, this, all this will make sense because uh, we don't hear what they hear. So that's very important. Don't disregard it. If they ask for it, it's because there's something there. Whether they didn't know how to explain it, again, that's our job to interpret. So very important. Uh, this mostly applies, I would say, to band members or, or even uh, uh, singers who perform it with an instrument. You know, learn the technical aspects of the musician's equipment so you can better communicate with them and understand, you know, when dealing with their in-ear mixes. Uh, again, you know, working in a studio, you get to work with all these different artists and, and musicians, and you kind of learn certain pieces of equipment, pedal boards, keyboards, uh, drum, you know, uh, electronic drums, um, all these things that, that, you know, you would think, well, I don't need to know that as a modern engineer or, or learn about MIDI or whatever. Uh, you know, anything that you could know about the equipment that you're using, even though you're not using it directly, is the guitar player's pedal board or is the keyboard player's uh, setup with main stage uh, or the drummer's drum pads, whatever it is, you can always be helpful working with your backline techs and, 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 and figuring things out if something's wrong, or if you need to get something out of that unit that perhaps they're not using, a specific feature that you feel might help you uh, to get a better mix. So I find that again to be something that is important when I'm preparing for these things. Um, you know, there's a, a quick story. Uh, I was working with this artist in uh, the drum tech or backline tech, it was a one, one tech really, uh, we were using V-drums, you know, electronic drums. And I'm at front of house, actually, and I knew the V-drums pretty well because I used to use them in the studio with, a, with you know, some uh, clients of mine. So I had to learn it, right? So when I'm there, I go, well, this particular floor tom or tom is ringing. It just goes, doom, it just rings, even though it's an electronic drum. So I go, put some of that tape or or, you know, or a muffler on it, you know, kind of, because it has that built into it. You can literally put fake, you know, virtual pieces of tape on it. The kind of the guy kind of looked at me and kind of laughed at me, thinking, well, it's, a, "It's an electronic drum. What do you mean put tape on it?" He understood it as, as putting tape on the actual drum on the pad, which is not what I meant, of course. But uh, when I I literally walked to the stage and showed him that you can actually change the resonance of it by putting virtual tape or any kind of like, you know, uh, moon gel kind of uh, thing, you know, that 
that will help you with that resonance on an electronic drum. Uh, you know, he was pretty surprised by that, the fact that I knew those things. I think that kind of stuff is important to know. Um, guitar pedals, you know, we, you know, with Enrique, we work with fractals. We used to do line sixes. And, you know, as soon as I see that there's a new piece of equipment, I go and learn about it because then maybe I can help with certain features where I can help when we're trying to uh, work on the sounds for our next production or next tour. I can say, oh, look, you know, this thing also can do this type of cabinet or whatever. And we work it together with our guitar players and our techs to make sure that the sound is exactly what we're all looking for. And of course, in partnership to, with, with Front of House and, and the musical director and all of that. So I think it's very important to know that um, equipment. Even if it's as an overview, just kind of like have, it, have a little bit of knowledge on it. It will help you in the long run. And then when, when the band members using that equipment are explaining something to you, it will make sense, you know, because of one of the effects that they're using and how to approach it or how to change uh, patches or scenes or how to make one scene louder than the other, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, it helps you because that's one less move that you may have to make during, during the show. If you're focusing on your main artist, that's one less move you have to do for perhaps a band member because it's all controlled via their own equipment. So it's all helpful at the end of the day. Uh, study, uh, study the artist's music in detail. That's another thing that, you know, we could technically walk into a gig and start mixing, even if we never heard the music. Uh, is it doable? Yes, you know, but it will probably sound like a very technical, non-musical mix, because at that point you don't really know the nuance of their music. You don't know when the solos are gonna happen, you don't know when the little noises that maybe the keyboard is making in a certain part, or the song are happening so you can enhance that or bring it up and make it uh, sort of like a front of house slash record mix experience. Uh, so I, you know, learning the music of the artists that you're gonna uh, work with, it's, it's imperative, I, I believe, because it will give you an upper hand on knowing what to do next. You know, it would also give you an idea of what the artist is expecting. You know, if you've never heard the music, even if it's a music style that is not your cup of tea or, or perhaps you never mixed before, figure it out. Ask for the set list, download, uh, at the very least, whatever the set list is, if not their whole collection, so you can see what the transition has been or, or you can understand what their idea of, of, uh, uh, of their mix is and what they're used to. And then you can at least try to come close to that or, or perhaps even be able to deliver that to them. Um, there are artists that are very in tune with, with their production and their mixing uh, um, style when it comes to their studio projects. And, you know, because they know some of the technology is available, sometimes they say, well, you know, for most of the show, it's cool if it just, you know, give me a good monitor mix. But for this song, I kind of need that effect that I'm using on this record just for them to get that vibe, whether it's a distortion effect or delays or any chorus effect. Um, so if you study the music in detail, you, you will be able to deliver that without an issue. Uh, so that's, that's pretty important. I feel that um, if you kind of cover all these things that I'm on this slide of beyond mixing, these are things that, like I said, they're not part of a technical thing. They're really uh, just you going the extra mile, learning different things, communicating with your artists, you know, building trust, as I mentioned there, and, and just basically not, not emphasizing so much the technical aspect, instead the personal aspect, you know, being aware of your artist, being aware of what's happening, and all those, all those things as a whole. Um, so next is something I mentioned earlier in the overview, which is don't be that sound guy. Um, I say this because, it, it, you know, I've been through this. I've been, the, I've been the house guy at a club. I am proud to say that I've never been the grumpy sound guy at a club because I've always loved mixing. I've always loved meeting new people and musicians and mixing all styles of music. I was mixing at a club called the Berkeley Square and, and you know, all these bands went through there that I had an opportunity to mix and, you know, Papa Roach and, 
you know, no doubt, which ironically went all the way around and, and I ended up working with Gwen, but no doubt went through that club and 311 went through a club, Defton, like all kinds of music, you know? And, and you get that opportunity to work with all different people, different engineers that come in and you pick up little tricks here and there, you ask questions, you know? Uh, that's, that's something that, you know, I'm proud to say I wasn't that grumpy guy, but I've also been the engineer for bands, up and coming bands or cover bands, and we travel and do things at the beginning of my career where you will always find the grumpy sound guy. And, and, and I, you know, I can't emphasize enough that if you don't like the job, then do something else. Uh, if you're there to mix or even help someone mix or, you know, you're the house person, then just enjoy it, you know, welcome people. And this goes, uh, clubs, you could be at a club and, and, and go through this issue or the church, uh, corporate events, uh, in the studio or in arenas. I mean, this happened everywhere. That like happens everywhere. There's a lot of, uh, sadly, like the grumpy sound, sound men's or sound guys as we call them. But I, my only advice I could give is don't be that guy. No matter what, ha what happened during the day, how are you feeling? Just, you know, stay, stay the course. Like, Always be respectful, professional. Don't let anything else get you to that zone where you're gonna be rude to an artist. For many reasons, I don't think it's correct to do that, but at the same time, you never know. You might be working with an artist at a club today that loves what you do, and then they'll take you out on the road, and then they become a huge artist, and then you, you were at the right time, at the right place, and, and you deliver such good quality of of uh, personal uh, uh, work and also you know your mixing skills, then you got that opportunity. If you're that grumpy sound guy, chances are they're not gonna take you anywhere. Um, you know you should always behave as if you're mixing the biggest band on the planet. For me, when I was mixing cover bands, uh, I've always felt like, okay, I'm gonna try to make this sound just like the original artist. I'm gonna imagine that I'm mixing the original artist and do everything I can to achieve that, no matter how crappy the equipment was in the club or no matter what the situation was, you know, always try to achieve that. And, and I think it's important to have that work ethic from the beginning, you know, always kind of have that mentality. It doesn't matter what, you, what your situation is, whether you work at a club, like I said, a church, corporate events, doesn't matter, you should apply that, you know. And this, this mentality should be kept whether you're working with up and coming bands or A-list artists. At the end of the day, they're all artists. Just some happen to be famous and they made it the right time, right place. Um, but talent, you know, you know, fame doesn't e equal talent. You know, you if you're working with talented musicians, you could do that at a club level, at a church or a, or a small corporate event or or whatever. It doesn't matter. They still deserve that respect in your professionalism, in order to you know. Um, they still deserve that, basically. I, I don't think you should treat them any different. And I've had that mentality since the beginning, and I feel that it's paid off. I feel that it's, it's, it's done me pretty good. Um, learn, ask, and be a sponge when you're around people. Um, you might think that you're not gonna learn from someone who perhaps has less uh, time than you mixing, but you will learn something. Even if it's what not to do, that day you will learn something. Um, but I've learned stuff from people who have less years doing this, and I've learned things every day. You know, I there's many mixers out there that are amazing, and they're way younger than I am, and and have less experience. You know, uh, so so that's important to not disregard anything just because of you feel like you've been doing it longer or anything. Just learn every day, ask a question. Uh, you know, my friend Danny Munoz, he's uh, he's an amazing engineer and uh, it, you know he's super young and he's great you know and I don't mind asking him questions about things because he's great at it you know so be a sponge learn ask questions you know we're learning things every day um, so make that something that is part of your model as you, as you move forward in your career because none of us invented this you know, we, you know, we're just kind of, we either learn something from someone else or we're watching webinars like we're doing right now, 
you know, so many people doing great ones out there. I'm always watching other people's webinars and, and, and cl master classes and things like that. You know, not because I do this for a living and, and I've been blessed with working with big artists, I stopped doing it. No, I'm learning, I'm learning every day. Uh, and I find that to be incredibly important, you know. And then once you've learned that, uh, anything that you may know, share it. Don't, don't be all like, you know, you know, this is kind of how I do it, but, you know, you do your thing. I'll, no, I don't mind sharing anything. Uh, like I said, uh, we, don't, we didn't invent any of this. These are just things that we develop as we go along or things that we learn from someone else and then we apply our own little uh, magic, if you will, to it or, you know, our own little approach to it and make it our own. Uh, but, you know, at some point we had to ask and we had to learn from someone. So, uh, um, so that's important. Um, experiment, you know, challenge yourself to try new things. Uh, it's very easy for us to get set on, on, on one way of doing things. Um, you know, at the beginning of my career, I remember we were, you know, what, you know, touring or whatever we're doing. And for most people at, at a young age, their ultimate goal is to make sure that kick drum sounds the loudest and the biggest. Meanwhile, everything else sounds really small, you know. Uh, so that's something that, you know, you learn with experimenting and, and, you know, challenging yourself to do a different type of mix. Listen to other people's music. And when you listen to people's music, you're going to notice that the kick drum is not the loudest thing, you know, when the, when the music is playing. It's usually, it's well balanced. You can create impact without having just one instrument be the loudest thing. So anyway, experiment of ways on how to accomplish that, experiment with ways of, you know, trying different, uh, different things, different approaches. If you see someone doing something different, running things through groups in a different way that you do, try it out. It may, you may learn something, you may be surprised of how you can approach uh, something that someone else was doing that you really liked into your workflow. So that's really good. So be that guy who learns, and don't be the guy who doesn't want to learn anything. Uh, if, if you can be in a situation where, you know, they didn't bring you your, the proper equipment that you, you were expecting, and this goes at all levels, you know, it could be a, a small event to anything big, and you, you know, you, you just kind of have to improvise, you have to make it work. A lot of times there's no time to get any gear from anywhere else, and you just have to work with what's there. So uh, keep that in mind, improvise, figure it out. You know, you only have this many mixes to deliver to someone, well, then everybody gets a mono mix maybe for that day, or figure it out. This board only has this many oxes. Okay, well, I need to find a way to do that, you know, or share a mix with, with some people um, and when it comes to monitors, of course. Uh, so yeah, so find yourself improvising to do whatever it is that you need to do to accomplish uh, the goal, of, you know, or your task. So, so that's very important. Um, something very crucial when you're doing um, monitors is staying calm and collected. Again, why do I put this on the list where it's don't be that sound guy? It's because a lot of people get frustrated with the artist. I've seen it, because I've been the artist, I perform on stage too, and I've been, you know, sound engineers, would always come back with some answers that would just make you feel bad just because you asked for something. Or, you know, uh, I remember even having a, a, a Zoom meeting with a bunch of uh, singers, very well accomplished singers, and they wanted to have a perspective from a sound engineer, a modern engineer more specifically. So their question was, what can we do to not piss off the, the modern engineer? And that question really hit me because it made me realize that performers or singers specifically are afraid to ask the monitor for some stuff because of that whole, you know, grumpy sound guy syndrome, you know. I, and my answer to them was like, well, don't be afraid of asking for anything because, you know, we are there to serve you. We're there to, to help you do a good show. If, you know, it's not my place to get frustrated because you're asking for something. If you can't hear yourself, then it's my job to figure out why. You know, now if I determine that at some point the requests just keep coming and they're just, in my mind, not making sense, I need to find out why I feel they're not making sense because 
like I mentioned before, I don't want to disregard their requests, you know, and they were making examples as, you know, we're using wedges and some of us are using in-ears. So I was kind of going through through what my process will be and at no moment in my process was like dismissing them. In fact, I was like, why, why do you feel that you even need to ask us questions? He goes, and a lot of them, they all share their experiences that when they will ask something to the engineer, they'll say, yeah, this is all you get. Or, or you, you know, I don't want to turn it up because it will feed back, you know. But then you as the engineer, you have to be able to turn it up and cut those frequencies that will feed back, you know. Um, so, yeah, so they were tailoring their requests based on their experiences with sound guys. And that's not good for all of us. Kind of gives all of us a bad name too. And, you know, and, and there are grumpy sound guys that are all the way on all levels, you know. People who perhaps are not as as uh, cordial to opening acts because they're the opening act and whatever. I've, I've been through that. I've experienced that uh, where I'm, I come in, you know, I, I could have been working with headliners, but that one day or that one tour I came in with, with the opening act and the headliners engineer was just not the friendliest person to say the least but uh, you know you kind of have to maneuver around that but it's it's pretty sad that we have to go to that we're all colleagues and nobody knows who you work for the night before at the same time no one cares either like you know you have to not be the guy that walks in and the first thing you do is dropping your resume you know uh, i've done uh you know, like festivals things, small festivals at my church. You know, I'm talking small festival where, where uh, like a kid's band will go play and their dad is like their manager slash roadie guy doing everything. And and I was there just helping out with sound, with a small sound system. I, I treated them as if I was working with my alias artist. They didn't know that the night before I was doing a show with Enrique and, or I just flew in from, you know, Europe working with Enrique or Gwen or whoever, and they don't know that. And I didn't come in and say that right away. All I did was take care of them, make sure they were comfortable with my whatever my 16-channel mixer that I was using for that day was. You know, and of course, people start coming in, oh, you know who's working with you, you know who's helping with the sound, he's so-and-so. And I go, that doesn't really matter. Today I'm with you guys. I'm, I'm, this is what I'm doing for you guys. And that's important to be that way, professional at all levels, and regardless of what you been, were doing the night before. You know, if you're gonna be a professional, you should be a professional at all levels and with all levels of artists. At the end of the day, they're all artists. They're all trying to get their craft out there. And you, If you can help them in any way, they might remember that. They might remember that you were nice and, and kind to them and, and ethical, professional. They'll remember that. They'll, they'll see it as a good experience for them. So I, I think that's, that's uh, pretty important. Uh, so don't be that sound guy, please. No one. Just be be professional, kind, ethical, you know. So um, next point here is achieving your mixing goals. Uh, what I mentioned before as well is like keeping, keeping track of what your music style is that you're going to be mixing, you know. Uh, volume, very important. Not, not, not to uh, overdo it. Especially now with in ears, you don't really have to be that loud. You can keep your your artist safe, you know. Um, so between music style and the volume, you can find that little sweet spot of what what you're trying to deliver to your artist. You know, listen to it. You know, if if you're doing hip hop, then of course obviously there there'll be low end and and kick drums are feature a lot, of course. And and if you're doing salsa music, then you know timbales and congas. Make sure that's prominent because that's, that's your drumming, you know, and, and cowbells, uh, you know, keep an eye on the horns, all these things. So whatever the music style that you're doing, you know, uh, learn it, figure it out, even if you've never done it before. Um, keep an eye on the volume. Do, when working with in your space is very important. I'll discuss a little more uh, of what I do with, with that um, when I'm talking about effects and reverb and stuff like that. Production, you know, for me, this comes in with, you know, how are you running your show? You know, you sending stuff to, you know, any your monitors, any mixes to uh, video director, lighting director, um, you know, all of that stuff that will take your mind away. So when you're 
when you're working with mixing the artist, you can just focus on that and no one's coming back to you to tell you, oh, I need this, I need that, or the video person needs this. If you handle all that ahead of time and everybody's got their mixes, everybody got everything that they need. If you have dancers, make sure they can hear themselves. Everybody that is part of the show is important. It's crucial to this. It's not just your position. It's not just you trying to say, well, I'm the monitor mixer. I don't really know or care what the dancer's gonna be doing. No, you know, you, you work it out. You make sure that they can all hear themselves so they can perform to the best of their ability for the artist and for the audience. So, so that's all good. And instrumentation, uh, I'm kind of going quick on these because uh, time is going by fast. Uh, you know, be aware of the instrumentation that you have for those, that particular music style, like I mentioned before, whether it's a percussive uh, style of music or, you know, heavy drums for rock or guitars, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, the artist and musician's preference. You know, everybody's different. Everybody's going to want things in a different way when they're working with the in-ears. Uh, make sure you address that. Make sure you're, you're uh, 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 you know, listening to what the request, as I mentioned before. Um, some people like a record mix and some won't, which brings me to the utility mix or a musical mix. Um, utility mix could be something that someone just wants to click, vocal, a little reverb, and, and that one guitar. A musical mix, of course, being something that represents a little more what the whole music style is. All the instruments blended properly, properly and then kind of like balanced as you go along, not just set it and forget it. Um, artist placement, you know, where do you want them to, to be? Like, do you want them to be dry, hearing your face very close? Or do you want them to be in, in a certain space, you know? I had an artist tell me, you know, I like to feel like I'm in an arena all the time, whether we're in or not in an arena. So I'm like, you know, with a lot of reverb, kind of gives them that space and they feel comfortable that way. Uh, the psychology of it is a big part of when you are working on a mix too, because then, you know, having that communication that we mentioned before and be able to, to make the artist feel good and, and, and comfortable and, and, you know, be in their head, but in, in the positive way, like, you know, knowing that, you know, you have their back and, and, you know, making, you know, you engaging with them in a way where you can put them at ease so they can come and perform. I think that's, that's very important as well. Uh, I kind of glanced through those very quickly, but uh, some of this was covered before as well as this. Uh, snapshots, very important uh, when working on, on, on my mixes v with virtual sound check. Prepare ahead of time. You can pre program these. Um, you know, whatever you don't need to be recalled, you want to just mix it live. You can put it on recall save. Anything else, you know, you can just recall as you go along for your show. Um, you know, this, this, you know, for me, I, a lot of the volumes are automated, some of the pans are automated, and, and the plugins, you know, I, you know, different delay times, different reverb times. Um, so this is a very, very important feature that you can have on any digital console, small to large consoles, they all have pretty much snapshots. I have a, it was a 16 channel Behringer here, and it also gives you snapshot, uh, functionality. So you can use this at all levels. So very important. Um, <clears throat> EQing, when I'm using, uh, you know, corrective EQ is to literally filter something that I feel that is, uh, hindering uh, a nice contour on the mix if I'm EQing like the master, the main bus or whatever, or if you need to uh, clean up something that is, uh, um, you know, really like uh, messing with the input or the mix, you know, you're correcting something. If it's tonal, those are usually broad strokes that I do, whereas um, I'm really shaping a certain sound, you know. Um, Subtractive is when we're focusing on removing what you don't like, the frequencies that you don't like, uh, and additive, additive is when you're actually adding things, when you wanna add a little air to a vocal or you wanna add a little bottom to a bass or a kick drum. Um, you know, when you're subtracting EQ, uh, it's beneficial too because whatever you take out and then you make up on gain, you end up with what you wanted in the first place. So those are things to, to keep in mind. I'm kinda going very quickly on this because this was part of the uh, part one of the uh, first video that we did. Uh, same with plugins, you know, these are tools that will help you complement 
you mix. Uh, they're they're not you know 100% crucial. A lot of consoles uh, have built-in uh, you know EQ and dynamics, and they have their own uh, effects and and reverbs and things like that. But these are tools that you can use to to complement what you're doing, or they're tools to help you achieve something. Um, but at the end of the day, they're you know they're tools, and and your abilities what is what's gonna um, show your performance a lot more of what you're about or how you mix. You know the plug it won't make you or break you at that point. It's more of more of your ability to pay attention to your artists and give them a, a well balanced mix. Mix you know. So I think that's that's something to keep in mind. Also, this was part of the review, and of course remember that having a loud volume. Uh, doesn't equal a good mix, you know, and that goes from the studio like I'm in my studio now and if I'm mixing an album I don't you know Having it loud, you know, it gets you excited and you're feeling good about it And then when you listen it to any and any other system or quieter or anything everything sounds a little unbalanced so So that applies to when you're mixing any for an artist. I think it's important that you um, You know Keep that in mind and protect their hearing you know, you can explain that to them. You can have conversation, which is when the communication and the trust comes in. You know, I have artists say, hey, you know, I wanted a lot more of this and of the click, and 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 they remove one ear out, and you're like, I can't turn it up any louder because I'm I'm hurting your ears at this point. Even though they have the option to turn the body pack up, they know that they have to keep it at a certain spot, and they want me to change it in the balance of their mix. But I've had this conversation where it's like, I'm not gonna hurt your ears. The only way it can help you is when you keep both ears in, and then we can go from there. Um, so if you don't, like I said before, you don't BS them, you don't go beat around the bush, and you just tell them honestly how you can help them, and and they understand that, and they see that you're trying to take care of them too. You know, they don't see that you're just not doing it because you don't want to. There is a reason why. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, the result is that louder is not better. So if you encourage your artist to always start their body packs a little quieter, um, they can only always go up. But if they start loud and they go up, then it's going to be really loud. And their ears will be fatigued and they won't even notice how loud it is, but it will be really loud. So uh, louder is not better. So that's something to definitely uh, keep in mind um, as you move forward. Whether you're using in-ears or you're still using side fills and wedges, you know, try to keep it to worth just enough where they can hear it, you know? Let's see. Oh, this is one of the my main um, topics that I, I always like talking about. Um, and I feel that it gets overlooked. Uh, it's the occlusion effect. You know, anybody who's wore earplugs before, and, and you can start hearing the inside of your bones and your face or you walking and you hearing, you know, the steps or if you're chewing something, you can hear all that in through the inside, right? So I, I, I find that, you know, when we were wearing in-ears and your artist is wearing in-ears, it's, it's important to realize that that takes a big effect on how your mix is going to be, especially in a vocalist. It also, uh, this also comes in play a lot with horn players that are wearing in-ears because, you know, they're hearing themselves, like I said, through their bone. And really the initial, the initial thing that they hear is what's on figure A, which is basically like a big bump on, on like 250 cycles and, and then the high end goes away. And you can even try as, as if you put your, fingers in your ears and you start talking like I'm doing right now, all of a sudden all the clarity goes away and I'm hearing myself inside my head, right? So you get all this bump on the low mids and then the high end goes away, so that clarity goes away. So if you ever experience your, your singer asking you for a lot of clarity or, or it's muffled or it's, I want, I want it brighter, and for you as the mixer, you're like, but that's too bright. Well, for you it is because you're not the one singing. And, and that is what makes the difference. So to compensate, you know, I usually just do kind of the opposite. But if you notice, I didn't go all the way 
in the reverse of what whatever the the figure A is, because I'm trying to use. I mean, this is obviously an example. It's not an accurate description because it varies from person to person. But um, basically, what I do is to compensate for that occlusion. Basically, when you're plugged up, you get that bump on that low mid, and the high end kind of goes away. High mids kind of goes away. So I compensate for that. So I remove some of the low meds and add some clarity to it. Now, the reason I went kind of halfway only is because what comes in play is also how I have my, my master buzz. If I have any kind of EQ to create some kind of uh, contour on, on the whole mix, and also how loud they're running their pack. Um, I usually like them to run their pack at a level where, um, you know, they just bring it up slowly until they hear themselves clearly, not loudly. And, and from that point forward, I EQ and, I, and adapt this, this curve, you know. Obviously, you know, you can use a, uh, you know, a multiband compressor, uh, you know, or just an uh, uh, EQ and, 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 and get this sorted and, and fix this. Uh, and then really there are other variables like if the singer is backing up from the mic a lot or if they're really close uh, This would apply mostly if they're close Which is why I recommend a multiband because then you can kind of automate this when they're far away That low med part stays flat which means you kind of using whatever they hear through the bone as the warmth of their vocal sound and when they get really close You kind of take it with that warmth so it doesn't double up on whatever they're already hearing um, so that's something that is, it's, uh, uh, overlooked. I feel a lot of times if, you know, I, I usually on sound checks, there's a few things that I do. I either go, um, and, and, you know, of course with the mic, like most people will do you test it. You know, I, I try to sing a little bit and walk around the stage. Sometimes I'll sing with a band and, and, and I want to hear exactly what my artist will hear with the PA on as well. And and uh, and the, their inner pack and everything exactly as they will be hearing it, and that lets me know how to approach all this EQ, because uh, the only difference will be that I don't have an audience, you know, but but this allows me to understand what they're gonna hear. So when they ask for it, I can't dismiss it, which is what we discussed earlier. I can't disregard it if they tell me. You know, I don't have as much clarity as I like, or it's muddy still, whatever. I know because I know that because of the occlusion effect, and on top of that, standing in the middle of the stage or on the runway with a PA blowing at you in subs and everything, that occlusion effect it almost seems like, you know, times two or times four. It almost seems like more. So I try to use the, ear, the in-ears as earplugs that have some sound coming out of it. So basically, let's take advantage of it so we can, you know, reduce the amount of noise that they're getting and just give them exactly that clarity that they need in their in-ears at the proper volume. And that, I only accomplish it with, with you know, keeping in mind this. Um, if you were to stand next to me while I'm mixing a show, you'll notice that I'm, I'm singing or humming the song loud, as if I'm performing in a way. Uh, not throughout the whole show, but certain parts where I feel like I'm noticing that they might be feeling a certain way, I start doing that to to make sure that what they're hearing is I'm at least close closer to that, because otherwise, what I hear will never be accurate, you know. Um, and this brings me at least closer to what they're experiencing by me humming it, by me singing it uh, as they're performing, uh, because to me it might sound thin. I might hear the vocal being thin at mixed position, but when I start singing, it doesn't sound thin anymore because now I'm compensating with that, all that 250 or 300 cycles that are there coming from my bones, that kind of all of a sudden, it sounds warmer. It doesn't sound as bright as, as it will sound to anybody else. So this is kind of important to, to keep in mind, um, you know, test it out, sing, you know, walk into, during the sound checks, Walk right next to your artist and stand right there, so so you hear exactly what they're hearing, and and obviously if they're singing on soundcheck, you're not gonna be singing on the mic or or talking on the mic, but you can at least stand there and see other 
other issues that might, you know, might be contributing to this. Uh, but definitely do not overlook this. This affects, you know, horn players, drummers, you know, because um, they're hitting the drums and it's coming through their bones. Uh, how you approach EQing that, which we could address maybe on a, on a future uh, video as well, a webinar, um, EQing drums and, and processing drums for drummers exclusively or even for everybody as a whole. Um, but this is all part of it. So please don't ignore the occlusion effect. It's definitely something that is there that we need to keep in mind when mixing monitors. A lot of us deal with it. You know, there was a time where I would deal with it not even knowing what it was. Uh, but I would just logically think, well, I'm hearing it this way. I should cut all this. Even though it sounds thin to me, it will be, it will be proper for my artist. So uh, that's something that is it's, uh, 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 important not to overlook. Um, and then also using effects. This is, this is also something that comes in play with all of this. You know, it'll be very easy to just bring up a vocal, a drum, or whatever, a guitar. And just leave it bone dry. Everybody can hear it; it's fine. But if you're able to to place it in a certain space, it may not seem as loud. Or in a mix, you kind of find a a position in the mix by by adding some effects. You know, where there's a reverb, a little echo, a little doubler. Uh, you know, I like using saturation, so that gives them gives a little more edge to certain things and uh, make them pop a little more. Uh, but definitely creating some form of texture all around your mix and and space, adding space to it, I think is important. Uh, it definitely makes the experience for your artist a lot better. Um, and, and it also allows you to give them, you know, a more exciting mix. You know, with, you know like uh, Gwen likes using delays. So I play with the delays. The delays change, change tempos with my snapshots. Uh, and you know, constantly writing that delay, like on certain words, you know, doing, you know, delay shots. And for her, that's exciting because it, when she's performing, she's hearing delays in certain parts, you know, it's exciting for her. So, so once you, you realize that and, and, and they enjoy it and they like it and they tell you, this is great, you know, I can hear this and I like it, blah, blah, blah. Then it makes, it makes a big difference. It, it makes for a better experience, you know? Um, you know, one of the, the, the final things I, I will say, um, you know, for this webinar will be, um, and you, you, we all should go by this, uh, because of digital uh, mixers and everything, we, we always tend to uh, look at our EQ, you know, and, and kind of mix based on the way things look. Um, you know, mix with your ears and not your eyes, you know, that's very important. And I know this, this, these photos look a little goofy, but it's kind of just to make that point, just to get that point across that, you know, um, it, it's not about how, what the EQ looks like or, or anything like that. It's what it sounds like. You know, we used to do that without any screens back in the day on an analog console. We used to just move it, you know, we'll find a frequency, maybe we'll look at it and we'll start turning but until it sounded good, we just moved that knob. And it's what my, my good friend Brad Divens will say, you know. Uh, and Brad, if you're watching, you know, love you, buddy. Feel better. Um, he would always say, I'll just twist knobs until it sounds good. And he has a point, you know. It's, it's something that you have to do. You can't go by the way it looks. I had someone come in, a friend of mine, you know, a great engineer. He, he will come in and he saw some of my cues on the screen. He goes, man, you're really cutting a lot here, and you're really doing that and boosting this a lot or whatever, you know. And then we were playing the virtual soundtrack for him, and he was like, wow, this just sounds awesome, you know, good job or whatever. I would have never thought it would be like that with the way it looked. I said, well, I'm just doing it based on what it sounds like, you know. If it ends up looking kind of funky, so be it, you know. Uh, I, I figured the way I look at it is that what's on the screen is just a computer representation of whatever we're actually doing, but there are other variables, you know, there are other things happening in, you know, on your mix bus, or maybe that source sounds a certain way, whatever it is that you gotta do, I think to make it sound good, you should just do. Um, and with that, I think I'm gonna um, 
go to uh, uh, I'm gonna share some of my information in case anybody wants to reach out um, here's my uh, my uh, social media um, in case anybody wants to reach out and, and send me a message or any questions that perhaps you didn't get to uh, today but right now I guess Michael we go to a Q&A Absolutely. Hey, Eddie, first and foremost, that was outstanding. We do have a few uh, questions here in the, the yep. Q&A. Um, you had talked about the oculation effect and, and, and reverb, and, and this one kind of, uh, this question kind of goes hand in hand with that. Hopefully, you know, it, it, we're not repeating ourselves, but this, this seemed interesting. With your vocal EQ that is cut, that compensates for the occ occlusion effect, do you find that it can sometimes make a vocal reverb send too thin do you double patch channels for this or is it simply not an issue in your experience that's a good question because um actually let me go to here i guess so uh um that's a good question because you know i don't feel necessarily that it gets too thin and if it does you know you know i can eq the, if, it, if that reverb is particularly for that artist only then i'll i'll eq the verb if i have to uh but i haven't found that is an issue for me uh, because if, if anything, I'm not sending a lot of that muddiness to the verb as well, you know? Uh, you have to remember that all of that has to come as a package. Like if we're trying to keep that clarity and that occlusion out of the mix, then, then if the reverb also doesn't have that low end on it or that low mid, it would also keep it clean for, for the ears. Because if I keep the reverb with that low uh, low mid bump it would also make it very muddy for them in their ears uh, i ha i have had situations where i double patch the vocal so i can treat them differently uh but that's mostly been the case when i have to run wedges as well you know if i'm running wedges and in ears then i will double patch them eq differently most most likely the one for the wedge all it has is a high pass filter uh and then you know send it to the verb and it's fine. If I have an issue, I'll just EQ the reverb. But that's actually a good question based on what we were talking about, yeah. Interesting. Here's another one. Is there a difference between mixing for TV studios, shooting studios, and music studios? Have you experienced higher reverberation um, at times or higher noise in TV studios than the music recording studios? Wow. Uh, is there a difference between mixing TV studios, shooting studios? Uh, you know, I... I haven't encountered that issue, at least in, in the TV stuff that I've done with my artists. They're usually well, you know, um, uh, acoustically treated rooms um, as far as having it be like with a lot of reverberation or anything like that. They're usually not that uh, reverberant at all. Um, and, you know, again, because I'm using their in-ears as, as earplugs, you know, and then I just bring in the sound that they actually need at a certain volume, uh, it keeps everything very clean. You know, the most reverberant rooms that we work with are obviously arenas, um, but I haven't encountered any rooms that are for TV or studios that are reverberant that way. If, if you go to a recording studio that has a big tracking room, yes, of course, that has a lot of ambience, uh, but I find ambience to be a great thing because to me it gives, a, it gives you acoustical information of whatever your source is. And then whether you use it or not, that's up to you. Uh, like if we're recording something on a big tracking room, you know, most people put room mics all around or room mics closer to the drums or whatever. And then you get to decide how big you want the room to sound. That's when it comes to like the studio portion of it. Um, and, you know, and a lot of artists now are using their in-ears to record in studio. So I feel that that makes, um, makes a lot of sense, you know, instead of just the overhead uh, kind of headphones. Um, and then again, once they're plugged up, I think you have the option to handle that reverberation of that room as, as you please. It's kind of a, a follow-up question to that. It also talking yeah. about different types of rooms. Um, in recording, do you prefer to have the recorded dry in a dead room and then add the effects digitally or have it recorded in the right room, reverberation time, in in the studio in like as far as studio acoustics and, and how do you prefer it oh that's that's cool too because uh, you know i i like to capture the natural room and if you have it if you have the room capture it like you, you can always enhance it or you can always not use it 
but I think capture the natural habitat of where the source was is is crucial, you know, uh, and which is why also live we use you know we use audience mics or we use room mics, um, you know, to give them that sense of space. Otherwise, everything would just sound very up close to you, you know. Uh, as far as digital reverbs, you know, there's a lot of great reverbs out there. Of course, you know, having that natural room is it's is you know the best way, but there are many instances where you don't have that luxury. You have to use digital reverb. So I would say, uh, you know, if you're in the studio, capture the, the, the room, you know, the environment as you can. If you're recording a live show, you know, and because it's gonna be broadcast, you know, on TV later, then capture all the ambient, you know, maybe put six mics around, 10 mics around to capture not only the audience, but capture the arena itself. So when you blend that in with your mix, it actually sounds natural. It doesn't seem out of place with whatever you're mixing at, you know, because when you're recording all multi-track, obviously it's all dry and everything. So I will say, try to capture the room whenever you can. And then if you need to enhance it with a little bit of digital reverbs, why not? We've got a, quite a few uh, questions coming. We'll try to get to as many as possible. Um, here's another one. How hard do you hit your buses? Is there a limiter on them? There is, um, you know, I like running the console pretty hot. So I'm, you know, you, you know, I'm pretty much at maybe negative three, you know, so I'm three to be below zero, but I'm running also my, uh, uh, my in-ear system at negative 12 and nothing ever clips. Everything's, you know, to the max without clipping. My limiter is, is barely touching it. You don't really hear the limiter because I have stages of compression before it. Um, but the limit is there for safety, for any, any weird spike or anything that could happen, it will protect my artist or performer's ears. But yeah, I definitely, I definitely use a lot of uh, compression, and like I said, in stages. I don't, I don't comp use one and compress it a lot. I use you know, several compressors in stages sometimes. Uh, but for in-ears, usually my, my chain you know, will be something like a, like a Shadow Hills or a 33609, um, and then, you know, a Fatso. Um, you know, I could go into sometimes like a Pultic type EQ uh, for a little bit of, you know, tone shaping the overall mix, or I'll add a little shine to it. Uh, and then I finish, uh, I have a, a Brainworks uh, Digital V3 for stereo imaging and some like uh, filters. Um, and, and that's good because it had a, it has mid side EQ, and then I finish it with an ML four thousand, which is a Mac DSP limiter, uh, multi band compressor as well. Um, and that's been my chain for many years now, so it's it works out pretty good, you know. And and for in years, I can pretty much you know load and go because it just it just works that well. You know? Here's another one. Um, how do you handle the sound bleeding to the mics from the monitor speakers? and the other performers on stage, and then into the main mix and getting back to the monitors? Wow. Um, you know, I try to use anything that is bleed, anything bleeding through the mics, I try to use it in, 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 in one, one way or the other because if we, we're not gonna be able to fight it. It, it. it varies, you know, depending on where the artist is, is standing, depending on where things are moving, you know, we, we, you know, we tend to, uh, uh, Sometimes we want to gate it, we want to block this. We want, but honestly, trying to get rid of all the bleed is almost impossible in a live situation. So, you know, I just embrace it and try using it. Or if I'm getting a lot of bleed or ambience from the lead vocal mic, then I'll put less reverb myself. You know, I'll, I'll find a way to, to adjust it so it still sounds balanced that way. Um, on, on some of the, uh, when, whenever I can, I do have. Uh, like a like a PSE, like a primary source expander uh, that is basically acts like a like a gate almost where uh, where I make those mics shut off when they're not being used, like like back and vocal is or whatever you know. Uh, all the back and vocals are around you know the stage. If they're not being sang into, then they literally fade away, um, and that keeps some of the ambient down. Um, I have it like like on Gwen, I use one. 
Uh, and it's great because, you know, if she moves from, to certain places, it will still trigger it, and I'll just do those by hand, but for the most part, I don't shut it off. What I do, I just turn it down, like, maybe three or four dB. So when she's not singing, it just it just kind of lowers the volume of it so the bleed is less, but never shutting it off because it's it kind of, in their ears, it could get annoying because you, you'll hear the opening and closing, you know? But that's kind of how I deal with bleeding. I, I, I try not to stress over it because there's only so much you can do, and I try to use it to my advantage somehow, you know? Got time for just a few more. Um... One person said, I would love to hear any thoughts on gain structure, especially timbral, hope I'm saying that right, difference or of different preamp gain and any impact on amount of bleed from other sources, et cetera. Um, I mean, the way I handle my gain structure, I mean, it's, it's, you know, I first try to listen to what my source is. I want to make sure that I'm hitting a, you know, I usually keep it either negative six or zero on, on, on the input. But you, when I'm mixing it, and I'm trying to do uh, uh, the balance for the mix, I'll push the faders to a point where I'm, I'm driving, whether it's my, the input of the group or the input of the bus, where I'm hitting the, the, my compressor, where I only get, for instance, maybe one or two dB of gain reduction. Like, I try to balance it that way. Um, you know, I don't, necessarily pay exact detail of like each you know each channel like is this coming in at the exact right level necessarily no I, you know I'm not, I'm not you know I'm not clipping anything I usually like I said I go from 0 dB maybe maybe negative 3 or 4 or 6 depending on the instrument if I know there's going to be spikes you know but I try to leave myself some headroom from my inputs because they're all going to sum and they're all going to sum going into that bus. So I need to make sure I leave room for, depending on whose mix is it, what am I going to be incorporating to that mix and how I'm going to add it into that, that group, you know? So I try to pay attention to that, but still keep it a musical mix. I try not to get so caught up on, like, numbers, like I said before, because at the end of the day, it's, we're mixing music. No one's going to have a, a you know... Analyzer, just listen to things. People are you, you make the music, so if it sounds good and it feels good, you know, I'm okay with that. You know, maybe time for one or or, or two more. Um, do you find that latency from plugins, RF mics, etc., can affect how a vocal can interact with the occlusion effect for an artist? Absolutely, it could. Um, I try to be very careful with. My plugin selection usually, um, you know, I use like SSL channel strips, um, or if I feel that I, I want to use quite a bit of processing, but I don't want to deal with plugins, then I'll do it all in the console to avoid any latency. But I haven't had any latency issues. But if if I was to choose a plugin that is very taxing on DSP, chances are yes, I will start hearing that phasing effect or even the singer will hear it and certain frequencies will start getting canceled but as of now everything that is on my my show file none of it is causing uh any major latency or anything noticeable to anybody so but yeah that that would that could be that could be a problem if if i had the latency but no i haven't had that issue so just keep an eye on on your plugin latency or or uh when you're adding something to it you know we appreciate all the questions. We've got time for just one more. Um, if you can encounter, if you encounter feedback, do you deal with it on the output bus or do you deal with it on the input channel? That's a good question. Uh, lately, because most of the stuff I'm doing is, is all in-ears, I don't have to deal with feedback. But when I was dealing with feedback, uh, when you know, we're surrounded by you know, wedges all over the place, uh, I would usually just, if I had a certain EQ that was coming from the wedges, then I would just do it there. I would just do a filter for the overall wedges. Uh, if I felt that it was specific to that vocal that was really in front of that wedge, maybe I'll do the input, but honestly, for the most part, I would just do it on the wedge because I didn't want to alter the tone of that voice because that voice or that vocal mic, because it was also going through other people's monitors. 
or other people's in-ears, whatever the case. So instead of altering the mic, which could alter the sound for everybody else, I would just notch it on, on the wedges that were the issue causing the feedback. You know, I will find the frequency and notch that out. Amazing. Well, that's going to do it for our, for our time today. Uh, Eddie, wanted to give a big thank you to you for presenting this session. It's been fantastic. Also want to give a big thank you to all of our attendees and for all the questions. It's been amazing. The recorded version of this session will be available in the next few days, so please be on the lookout for that. And also be on the lookout for all of our upcoming sessions, as well as all the recorded versions of the sessions that have already taken place. For everybody, I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks again. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you.